All right, John's going to come up and speak. And I'm sure he's not very excited after spending a few days at the Randy Clark thing, so this should be good. Oh, hey, Rick, do me a favor. Pass. Pass those. Spread them around. Kathy's got some. Good morning. You, you don't have to. I, I'm, I'm not contagious. I had COVID. You know, I'm safe now. You don't have to avoid me. Some people are real uh, conscientious about that. So it's good to be back around. Uh, gosh, someone asked me this morning, how are you feeling? And I said, gosh, I feel like I got saved. <laughs> I feel a lot better. I didn't have a real bad case of COVID, but man, it's, uh, it, it packs a punch. So today, uh, I want to talk about uh, how do you swim with sharks? And you'll see this little outline. Uh, how do you swim with sharks? The answer is carefully. Okay, that's not, Mike's the only one that laughed. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. I'll give you the $20 after church. Uh, the truth is, this is about, the question really applies to politics. And, you know, as, as any of you know, you've, we've all learned the hard way that Engaging in politics is like swimming with sharks. It's just, it's a perilous kind of a thing. There's just so many pitfalls and problems and landmines. And uh, how many of you have, if, if you haven't experienced it personally, how many of you have seen someone say the wrong thing at a family gathering and the bear trap, boom, of Family conflict just opened up, right? Pretty soon people are throwing cranberry sauce at each other, and, you know, it was all downhill after that. So in Daniel 2, it's a great story, and it's full of, I think, insights that, that can inform followers of Jesus who want to who wanna engage in the political process, but want to do it wisely, effectively, and faithfully, okay? And we're going to look at a story. It's a great story. And there's, this story is, is layered with all kinds of insights about being involved in the political world, and being involved with human government. And it's impossible not to be involved in it at some level. But we're going to see... In Daniel's story, six, he gives us six insights. So we're just going to touch on them. I, I encourage you to, to, if you want to think about politics and, and think about how you are engaging in politics, go and read this story and kind of put yourself in there and look at what the, this story might say to you about sort of how you do your business, Okay. And I think it, it might yield some, uh, some surprising insights for you. So let's start reading. Now, there's, there's three movements in this story. There's a political crisis, okay? There's this divine revol uh, resolution, and then there's the aftermath, okay? So we're going to look through these three movements in this story. And it starts in verse 1, uh, Daniel 2, verse 1. Here's what it says. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before him, the king, he said to them, I've had a dream, and it troubles me. And I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you don't tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. Now, that's not a pretty picture to imagine, is it? Like, the king calls you in and he says, I need your help, guys. You know, you're my counselors. I've had a dream. 
and I want you to interpret it. And of course they go, well, please tell us what the dream is. This is how this works, right? And he goes, no, 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 this is not how this works. <laughs> I want you to tell me the dream, then I know you're going to interpret it, because you might game me, right? You might not have it figured out, and you give me all these fancy spins on it. And he says, listen, this dream's important. And so if you can't do this, why am I paying you? In fact, why are you taking up space? I'm going to have you cut into pieces, and I'm going to turn your houses into garbage heaps. And he would do that. That's the way these kings were. They would get up on the wrong side of the bed and just have people wiped out because they were in a bad mood. So this is a, this is a crisis, right? And who knows what else the king is going to do? He's got absolute power. That was the way that these kingdoms worked. So once more they said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. I'm certain, the king says, that you're trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you don't tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it. The astrologers answer the king, there's not a man on earth who could do what the king asks. Now, take note of that, right? Just it, from their perspective, this is an impossibility. Nobody can do this, what he's asking them to do, all right? No king, however, great or mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they don't live among men. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death because they were part of that cohort. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to, the, to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the end of the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God, from the God of heaven, concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom. Now, I want you to listen to this line. He gives wisdom to the wise. He gives knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Now, first thing you have to learn about this when you engage in politics is God only gives wisdom to people who are wise. I'm just going to let that sit for a second. That's what he says here, isn't it? Is it? It's pretty straightforward. So you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. some of you are going, well, where does that leave me? <laughs> right? Well, you know what the Bible says is a wise person? In your mind right now, you have an idea, uh, even if you don't, it isn't a physical idea of what a wise person is. Maybe they look like someone you know who's wise. <laughs> just, just kidding. Thank you, John. The Bible says the wise person is the person who seeks wisdom from God. It's that simple. You show your wisdom 
by seeking God's wisdom. And God promises, if you lack wisdom, he will give it to you. And he won't even, you know, wag his finger at you for not having enough wisdom. He loves to give you wisdom. He loves to give all of us wisdom. And so the wise person and the discerning person is the person who knows, I need God's wisdom. And if you're going to be involved in in the political process, you've got to constantly be saying, Lord, give me your wisdom. Because all around you are people who are willing to tell you what they think is the right thing to do. And they're just wrong so often. Not all the time, but so often. And so the only reliable source of wisdom was where Daniel went. You see how this starts? He knows uh, we need wisdom. And this is like a little precedent-setting point. You have to get this first. If you're going to engage in the political process, you've got to decide first that you're not going to rely on the wisdom that you get from your favorite website. First, you're going to go to God for wisdom, and he'll give you wisdom and discernment so that you can hear his wisdom from other sources that he's using as resources for you. Okay? Second, let's go on. Let's start in verse 24. So now the, the, the resolution of this crisis where the king's upset and everybody's upset, right? When, when, my mom, when mom is mad, you know, everybody's uh, in trouble. Then Daniel went to Arioch whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Don't execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I'll interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dreams means, what his dream means. Now, notice that Daniel's just called an exile from Judah. He's a nobody. Do you get it? I mean, he's been appointed by the king to work in, uh, amongst his, his administration. But they still, the, this is like the Babylonians, they have a name for people like Daniel. They would call them Jews. And Jew, a Jew used to really be a, ter- a derogatory term. It still is in a certain sense. It comes from Judah. And he says, these are exiles. And so people are exiles. He's saying, you know, the people, we, we, we went to their country and kicked all their butts. And then we took the best people back after we ruined their nation. And, you know, they're like second-class people. One of those people, he's the one king that says he's got the answer for, you know, your question. And I wonder if amongst the guard they're they're betting on how's this going to turn out, (laughs) right? Now, think for a second, too, of the confidence that Daniel had. They go and pray. Something pops into their head. They have no way to know, is this God? Now, they're going to die either way, right? But, I mean, you could die in your home, which is where they're probably all being killed, and then their house is being made uh, a pile of rubble, because that's what they do. They kill them in their home, and then they would just bury them in their house. And it was... It was a a public reminder of don't get on the king's bad side. And those kings used to use that that way. Think of the boldness of Daniel, the confidence he had in hearing from God. Now, we can be like that. We're meant to be like that, okay? So Daniel replied, no wise, oh, I'm sorry, the king asked Daniel, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel says, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain it to the the king, the mystery he is asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. Now, so... Think about that too. God's speaking to a pagan dictator and telling him what's going to happen in the future. Depending on what your political persuasion is, for some of you, that's like Joe Biden had this dream. 
Donald Trump had this dream. Hillary Clinton had this dream. George Bush had this dream. You're going, no, 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 no. That can't possibly happen. That person is a complete, utter jerk, right? You're probably right, but so was this guy. But see, God chooses. It's God's choice. So, and you know, you may disagree with that, but one of the things you're going to have to get used to is that is what God does. So, uh, he says, as you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the, revel- the, the revealer of mysteries showed you what's going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation, that you may understand what went through your mind. You know what that word understand is in Hebrew? It's yada. It means to know something in a very intimate way. God was revealing himself to this king. He wanted the king to know him. And he's showing the king what's going to happen, and he's showing his place in the world. He's, he's helping this king to kind of get situated in life and to see, wow, this is, my life has a purpose. It has meaning. I have a destiny. I have an identity. And where is it from? It's from him. So God is speaking to the king. He's doing, this is a real dramatic thing. This is a power encounter. And you're going to see in a second how the king responds. He's just, his doors are blown off, so to speak. So he says, you looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the same, excuse me, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he's placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You're that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom. Strong is iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with the baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock out of a mountain. Excuse me, this is the meaning of the vision of the rock out of a, cut out of a mountain but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, and the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate. I'm sorry, he didn't fell prostrate. (laughs) He fell prostrate. He fell prostrate before Daniel 
and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Okay, so God gives wisdom only to the wise. Second point you get out of this is that God is in control. God is in control even when it doesn't look like it. So Daniel is learning this lesson real time. He's in exile. He's essentially a a working slave to the king. His nation's been defeated. He's been uh, deported to, to Babylon, and he works for the king. He's not working in the slave mines because he's smart, and they recognize he has some talent. And so that's what Babylon would do. They would defeat a kingdom, and they would take the best of them, uh, of the people that they defeated. And then they would breed them into their community, right? So a lot of times, we, when we get into political situations, we think God is no, nowhere involved in this thing. There's no way on earth he's involved in this mess, right? There's all these people who think they have control all over it, and they're the ones that, are, that have the wheel. That's just not true. Now, I'm not going to belabor that point. I, you know, we've talked about that kind of idea. But you have to keep that in mind when you're in the political arena. God's the one that's ultimately in control. Now, I want to give you a, a, some balancing points to that. Two is God works through flawed human government. Actually, that's the only kind of government there is. Flawed human government. You have to remember that. Remember I told you my definition, and and I got to, by the way, I trademarked this. My definition of what the Bible says about human government is this. It's necessary and it's dangerous. And you can read every part of the Bible and see that. It is necessary. We have to have government. We have to have human government, but it becomes dangerous. That's why there's so much tension and friction around it, you see? And the fourth is God will replace, at some point, all flawed human governments. At some point, all flawed human governments will be replaced, even America. We gotta, you gotta, that's what he says here. It's not hard to look at this. Now, we, every people who are part of a flawed human government want their government to, to run at its best as long as it can. There's nothing wrong with that. But what he's saying is the kingdom of God is coming to fix what's flawed. And here's the thing about human government. It ultimately ultimately resists God and has to be replaced. Do you see that? And we have to be careful in our love for whoever we are, whether we're Americans or Peruvians or English or Afghanis, our love for our government can't blind us to the fact that at a certain point, every single human government will begin to resist God to the point that God says, you can no longer serve my purposes and I'm going to unravel you. And sometimes all he does is he just lets us have what we want. Do you understand? And it, we, we're so foolish that we think what we want is always good, and when we get it, it just wrecks us. That's what the Bible says. Sometimes God, well, I guess always what he does is his wrath is revealed by letting us have what we want. 
That's how God judges. Because what we want is self-destructive, ultimately. When we reject His wisdom and we decide to live by our own wisdom, we will become self-destructive. We will destroy our neighbor the way we're destroying ourselves. That's what happens. So, in, you know, Randy Clark did this the other night. He, he, he says when he goes after rabbit trails, he pulls his guns out and he shoots it. He, he wants to go down a rabbit trail, and he, one night he pulled out, he went, I'm pulling out my shotgun after this one, right, and fired it. Uh, we, just, we just have to, I'll let you, you sort that out, the idea that, that every government is going to ultimately reject God, and every government is ultimately going to, going to fall apart. It's going to happen to us. I hope it doesn't happen in my lifetime. I hope our government gets it together. I hope our nation gets it together. That's what I pray for every day, every single day. And I, many of you do too. But the truth is, human government is not the answer, ultimately. That's what this king had to learn. And this, that's, that's going to be one of the points we'll look at. Then the, this, and then the last two points are really simple. And I want to, I want to take one of them and, and unpack it a little bit. The fifth point is, God calls us to participate in our janky political process. Right? You go, what does janky mean? Well, you, it's obvious. It, it's a self-defining word. This political process that we're part of is janky. It's messed up. It's crazy. Isn't it? And yet, it may be better than any other one, but what does that say? It just shows you why Jesus is going to return and go, you guys just can't get it together. So I'm going to start over, and we're really going to have it done the right way, and I'm going to be the one that runs it. And then everything will really you know, run the way it's supposed to. But until then, we're in this thing, and we're called to be part of it. Now, that's how this story ends. Now, there's a lot of people who forget this simple fact. Uh, there's two main players in this story, but, you know, besides the Lord. There's Daniel, and there's the king. And this story is speaking things to both of them. They're both, and I encourage you to go back and look at this, and again, put yourself in Daniel's place and go, what is he learning through this process? He's learning and growing. Here's one of the things that he learned was this. Daniel, I want you to work in this broken, flawed government and be leaven in it. So God wants you, each of you, each of us, to participate in this process as leaven of the kingdom. He wants us, the, the leaven, if you know what yeast is, that's what leaven is. Yeast, I remember having these, pat when I used to work in this bakery, make donuts, we had these big, huge things of yeast. And we, had, we would make massive amounts of dough at a time. And we had these big mixers, and we would put the ingredients in. It was really, you know, very strictly uh, designed. We put them in there, and then it had this mixing uh, arm that would put into. We'd dip it down in there, and then it would just mix it. It would just work for a long time. It really took a long time. I, I'd always go over there because you have to do it that long. They go, you have to do it that long. It takes a while for the yeast, which is the active ingredient you to work into the flour and to chemically transform the flour. So we, the, the first thing about participating is you have to get into it. 
And, but you have to get into it with a purpose. And no, I am, I carry the yeast of the kingdom with me and in me. Meaning I'm going to be a change agent. This thing is not the way it's supposed to be. And I'm going to be part of God's activity to change it. Here's the thing. You're never going to be able to change it totally. You're not. It's going to be imperfect. And there's a lot of people who don't get it when they don't get this point that Daniel got because the old, Daniel was a person of real character and a person of deep principle and faith. And you read from chapter 2, after chapter 1 to chapter 7, he, ha, he and his friends have test after test after test where they're being tempted to compromise their faith and their convictions, and they won't do it to the point where they will die before they'll do it. Yet they worked in this dictatorship. And, you know, today we wonder about our predecessors, let's just say in our country, and we just want to completely dump them because they weren't perfect. What a silly idea. If you do that, in a hundred years, people are going to be dumping you because people are going to recognize how the time we lived in, which we thought we were bringing to perfection, was in fact a flawed human system. It will always be a flawed human system. It doesn't mean we can't look at something that's been wrong and say, wow, uh, we regret that that went on and that, you know, we didn't address it. But it's like we have this either-or mentality. Daniel didn't have that. None of those guys had that. They knew we can help bring light into this darkness, but we know we're not going to totally change it, and we're going to have to live with some tension in this situation. Do you see that? Can you see some of the implications of that? I'm not going to go into it. I just want you to think about that. Daniel met this king face to face, this bad dude, and he sees God is after this guy. God has given this guy a dream, and he's spoken to him directly. And God's drawing me into this, and the king wants to put me into this place of real responsibility. Do I want to be a part of this crazy system that conquers nations and does all this? And he goes, yes, I do. I'm not going to be Amish. God bless those guys, but they completely missed it. They don't see what the Bible calls us to do, which is really hard. They just want to avoid all those complications. And as, as godly as, as those people, many of them are, that is a terrible mistake. Because God told Daniel through Jeremiah, who was, a, who was one of his contemporaries, when you go to Babylon, I want you to not long to go back home. I want you to really invest in the city of Babylon. I want you to live for the peace of the city because your peace and the peace of the city are bound up together. I want you to, to buy farms, to get married, to have children, to plant vineyards, and live for the peace of the city and pray for the peace of the city. So he wants us to get into the political process up to our necks. And he wants us to be leaven, just like Daniel did. And it's messy, and it's hard, and there will be frictions and disagreements. And, you know, some of us are not real students of the founding of this nation, and we don't realize how wise the founders of our nation were. But they were wise in ways that we're not comfortable with, because we think... We have this idea that we can create a utopia. Our founders knew there is no utopia. They knew that. You have to read their writings. They knew we can, we can make something really good, but we can't make something perfect. And 
We are pluralistic. They knew back then they were already pluralistic, maybe not in the sense that we are now, but they were, because they were much more homogenous because they were almost all Europeans. And Europeans had a, you know, a homogeneity that we don't have now. We're Europeans and we're uh, Africans and we're Asian. And, you know, it's, uh, the worldviews that make up America now are, you know, it, it, global. And our country was made to try to live together and to move forward only through compromise. And I don't, that's a dirty word sometimes, but you can't look at our system of government and not see that it was designed for an imperfect world where people had to compromise to move forward. They had to persuade other people. They couldn't just cancel one whole group of people and say, you have no voice. <laughs> and so we have to fight that tendency. No matter how wrong we might really see someone is, because there are plenty of times where people really are just plain wrong. But our system is built on persuasion, and persuasion doesn't work this way. This is not how you persuade people. <laughs> Right? That is not how you swear. Did I hurt my shoe? No. Okay. But that's how we think it works. We do. We think that, that we can, you know, I, 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 when it, the bottom line, I just want power. No, we can't, we can't be like that. Our, our Constitution won't even let us ultimately do that. It's created three institutions within a government that themselves require compromises and negotiation, and, and it will always come to something that's imperfect. That's what Daniel lived in. But here's the, the last point is this. God's primary mechanism, his, his primary instrumentality for changing the world is not government. It's not government. Now, some of you who are more left-leaning don't realize you think that's true. The more government can do, the better. And some of you on the right think, no, we shouldn't even have a government, right? We should just all have farms. <laughs> but the truth is somewhere in between. And I just want you to know, and I'm not going to tell you which way I lean, but Government is necessary, and it's dangerous. And that scopes out the two sides of our political divide real well. So somewhere in the middle is where there's some, there's some real good ground right there in the middle somewhere. But that word, it starts with M, is really looked down on now by way too many people on either side of our political divide. And we in the church have to be willing to say, no, there are things that are right or wrong, but we're going to have to compromise and negotiate some of this, and we're going to have to do it with love. If, we don't, if we're not humble and loving, we don't have the truth. Do you understand? If you think you have the truth, you'll be humble and loving with it. Because if you have the truth, it will humble you first. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but I've listened to people, and I hear it in their voice, the truth, you know, and the veins are popping in their head, and I'm just going, man, I don't know. I don't know, man. And I know there's a place for anger and stuff, but you can't just be angry all the time. I mean, for nothing else, it's just not good for your blood pressure. And there's a lot of people that will just be put off by you. But if we have the truth, we will be humble and we will be loving. Proverbs says, Solomon was so wise. He said, a soft tongue, which was a Hebrew idiom for persuasiveness, for, for uh, winsomeness. He said, a soft tongue can break bone. To get it? It's possible. It doesn't mean you have to be a super up personality person. 
You know, that, that's not at all. You can be exactly your personality, but you just can't be angry and dogmatic and, and say, I've got the truth. Because God's main instrumentality in changing the world is the gospel. It's the gospel. And we're going we're gonna to close with a couple of things. The rock that the king saw, which is, I think, I think the king had an intuition I have something to do with this statue. This statue is about me. <laughs> and something bad happens to the statue. What's this about? I think that was, that was part of you know, his interest in this. But here's the curious thing. If you, wanted, if you want to wreck something, do you aim at the foot? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And do you use, because the word rock there is the word eben, and it just means a small stone. It's also the word that was used for what David put in his slingshot and slayed Goliath. Isn't that interesting? And so this rock, not cut out with human hands, strikes the statue. Now, it, it had a chronological meaning, but it also had an obvious interpretation, like why do you try to wreck the statue by hitting the foot? Because the gospel seems foolish. It just seems foolish. The message that Jesus was God in the flesh and he died for us because the problem that humanity has ultimately is sin. It's not an economic issue. It's not a political issue. It's not a sociological issue. It's a spiritual issue. And that when people hear that message it change, and, and they receive it, it changes them in a way that nothing else can. I mean, you see that? Nothing else can change it. The human heart. And so, God's only instrumentality, so God's primary agency in the world is not government, but the gospel. And so, we have to be people who primarily lean on the gospel as we engage in the political process. We have to have, the gospel has to inform how we engage and what our purposes are and, and and we have to communicate that thing to people because we're going to be in lots of situations where people are just frustrated at, at, at how slow things are changing, which is another thing we could have put in here. Things will only change slowly. That's the only way things ever change. It, it, they don't change rapidly. They just don't. They never have. That's a historical fact. And all the big changes that we talk about and we look back in history, we, most of them we just think happened like that, and they didn't. They happened over months and years. And the gospel works that way. All of you know how excited it was when you first heard about Jesus, and your life started changing. But you know, between now and then, you've done a lot of changing. Even if the early changes were real dramatic, and like, wow, that really impacted me, we still had a long ways to go, and we still have a long ways to go. And so, uh, we have to be more about the gospel than we are about politics. We, we just do. We have to be more about the gospel than we are about politics. Now, I want to ask you, Kathy, would you uh, hand me that microphone? The microphone right there to your left? Thank you. I just want to uh, ask two people. First, Shanna. Um, the gospel is really powerful in surprising ways. And we were at a conference this week, and uh, we saw some pretty wild stuff happen. Uh, but it's just stuff that the gospel tells us is meant to be changed by the good news about Jesus and, and the authority he gives us. So I want Shannon to tell us the story about a guy she prayed for. We'll see if this works. Testing one, two. There you go. Excellent. Uh, so since I'd been on a ministry trip with Global Awakening, I was uh, able to minister and pray for some people last night, uh, or Friday night, actually. And a man came up for prayer. He was an older man, a grandpa. He had some grandkids. Um, 
he came for knee pain, um, is what he wanted prayer for. He said that when Randy had started the sermon that his knees felt much, much better. But then throughout the talk, they started feeling worse and worse and worse until it was really bad. Um, and so, you know, he was familiar with church and healing and I was familiar and we looked at each other and we thought, hmm, it sounds kind of like a, maybe a demonic spirit or something. But I said, well, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and we'll pray and we'll see what happens. If nothing happens, we'll try another angle. Um, so I began praying for his knee. Uh, he said, uh, after doing that for a little bit, he said he started feeling shooting pain going up and down his leg and then it moved over to the other side of his leg. And you know, when it moves around like that, it's usually a sign it's not good stuff. Um, so without any prompting by me, if we were just continuing to pray, he said, oh, I suddenly remembered that when I was a teenager, I had dabbled in a Ouija board and participated in that. And I asked him, oh, wow, have you ever repented of that? And he said, I don't think so. No, I haven't. And I think my mom dabbled in the occult. In fact, I know that she did. Um, he said his mom used to go visit mediums and, and do card reading and, and that kind of thing. Um, so that led him to um, repent of those things. And so I just proclaimed the forgiveness of Jesus over him and that he's bought by the blood and that any, any spirit that thought had a claim over his body has to leave now. Um, and then he said he felt really frustrated. And I said, well, what, you know, what's that? Where's that coming from? And he said, I don't know. Like, kind of like, who do you think you are? And I said, well, I'm not anybody. I don't know. Um, and, um, and then he said, I just feel really stubborn. And so then he repented of, of stubbornness or a spirit of stubbornness or whatever the Lord was leading him to do. And I was just like, okay, you know, that's great. Um, then he said he felt like there was something trying to bite his knee. Um, so I kept praying for him and I said, all right, we're going to put a muzzle on that and then we're going to wrap your legs and, you know, with protection. And, and then um, we finished the prayer and, and all of that weird stuff stopped and it all ended. So basically the, the Holy Spirit was convicting him of things. He didn't have to conjure up this memory, but the Holy Spirit guided him to, to that memory. He was able to repent of that and then the weird stuff and the 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 weird kind of pain that was happening left him until he was um, left with just the normal knee stuff that he had. I, um, I don't believe he was completely healed of knee pain, but it was back to normal stuff. Um, cool. Thank yeah. you, Shannon. Then Kathy experienced, Kathy, come up here. Uh, she experienced a pretty interesting healing. So at this conference, many people had words. They, they lined up on either side of Randy, and they had words of knowledge. And so they would give a word, and then they'd line, line up so that anybody in the audience who had that condition can go, you know, to these people. And you know, thinking about it, there were so many health problems because so many people got up. So I was uh, standing at the side with John waiting. I, I felt like, well, with all these people, surely they're going to have a word that I could, you know, identify with because I have diabetes and Many complications that come with that, so kidney disease and liver disease and painful neuropathy. Um, so um, somebody gave a word for neuropathy and um, somebody gave a word for liver disease. So um, I'm looking around and I can't find the person who gave the word for neuropathy. Like, whatever, you know, image I had of them and the 
I thought blue jacket and all that. I couldn't find him. So I thought, I'll go to the liver guy. <laughs> you the, know, I'll take the a liver, liver guy. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing is, um, it reminded me of the woman who just wanted to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, you know. Because I'm like, okay. Um, and I start noticing that the sharp, you know, neuropathy, the sharp, sharp pains. And um, I'm noticing, like, my legs just feel peaceful. And it's... Um, decreasing it's it's almost like my legs were wrapped I can't say heat it was just this warmth and peace and I'm I'm realizing this because I'm so focused on the liver <laughs> but I'm going oh my gosh and I'm just online and experiencing this healing and and actually, somebody passed by who had given a testimony of a healing. And he's like, how you doing? And, you know, we actually knew each other. And I said, I'm waiting in line, but I'm also getting healed right now. And he goes, I'm going to pray for you. And um, so then he had to go. So I finally get up to the liver work guy who had the word. And he's like, how you doing? I go. Well, I'm getting healed right now. <laughs> My legs, it's like, I don't even know how many years I've had, like, the painful neuropathy. But then I was put on a medication for that nerve pain and things, and I had terrible side effects. Um, um, it's taken me three years to um, taper off of this horrific medicine. So... Anyway, and I'm just saying this. So he's like, okay, well, let's pray for your liver. And um, the whole time he was praying for my liver, I felt just now it was going down to my feet. It started in my legs, the healing, and now it was in my feet. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, so I, I don't know about my liver. I mean, I'm like, keep, you know, keep going. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm just so thankful. Thank you. That's cool. There was, there was some amazing healings. I just, I want to tell you this story. One of the ladies who spoke, uh, well, Kathy was uh, mentioning a guy who kind of comes on and off to the vineyard. Uh, his name's Paul. He usually sits over in this right-hand side. He's about my height, and he, he has a real close-shaved uh, head. And uh, Paul used to live in Columbus, and he moved to Florida because his mom was down there. He had to take care of her. And he was a carpenter, and he fell off of a ladder like 15 feet onto his back on concrete and, you know, broke, did a lot of damage in his back. And so uh, he had surgery, and he's been disabled. And so he, has, he just works as a driver because he can't do the things he used to do. And at the meeting, he got healed. And he felt this God touch his back. And he, couldn't, he could only bend so far. Like, he could only go like this, right? And I've known him a long time. It's really true. He just couldn't. He, he, his back won't bend. And he got up on the stage and said, you know, God really touched me. And he reached down and touched the ground, like just put his hands on the ground. Like his back had just boom. And, uh, and Paul is, is real un, unemotional. He did it. He said, yeah, so my back, so I'm better. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like that. And people are going, ah, people are clapping. Anyway, uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, up in Toronto, uh, there's a real move of God up there. And there was a lady uh, who was a, she was a, this burned out missionary. Her name's Heidi Baker. And uh, she'd been in Africa, and she came to Toronto to this, this meeting that was going on and on and on. 
six days a week, and the power of God was just being poured out on people. And uh, she had double pneumonia. She was completely, completely burned out. And she said, I, I, I came back, and if God wasn't going to do something in my life, I was just going to go work at Kmart because I just had no energy. And while, during one of the meetings, the Lord healed her of double pneumonia. And then he started speaking to her. And so Randy Clark is up teaching, and she just gets up in the middle of his teaching, and, and you'd have to know her. <laughs> She kneels down in the, in the middle of, you know, like in the front of the stage where he's teaching, and he looks at her, and he doesn't know who she is. And the Lord speaks to him, and he points to her, and he says, the Lord wants to know, he has a question for you. And she says, what is it? And he goes, he wants to know if you want him to give you Mozambique. He wants to give you the nation of Mozambique. And that's where she's a missionary, right? A burned out missionary. She just says, yes! The power of God falls on her like you've never seen before. And she shakes for a week. She completely has no ability to move. She's just shaking, like just shaking violently like a seizure, and people have to pick her up and take her home. They have to, her husband has to change her. He has to get food, put it to her. She could, she could eat, but she couldn't pick anything up. She was just shaking under God's power for over a week. And she said, the Lord showed me, you know, what I was supposed to do in Mozambique, and he showed me I needed him, and he also showed me I needed his body, that I needed people. Now, she's about, gosh, Heidi Baker's about that tall, right? She's this little blonde California chick. She went back to Mozambique, and in the last 25 years, they've led over a million people to Christ They've planted 10,000 churches, her and her husband, this little organization that formed. They have built, orf they run orphanages, they run free health clinics, they feed hundreds of thousands of people a year. They started home businesses, they drill wells for villages that don't have enough water. They have primary and secondary schools. They, this, because the, it's a war-torn, they're in a war zone. Northern Mozambique, if you don't know, it's a war zone. Uh, El Shabaa is an Islamic organization that's affiliated with ISIS. And they've tried to kill her multiple times, and God just spared her. She goes out into the bush, out into the worst places you can imagine. And the power of God is just on this little woman and this ministry that was birthed when she just said yes to God. And uh, that, the, the verse that the Lord spoke to her about was that the same verse that, you know, has really been big to the vineyard, which is Isaiah 61, 1 to 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to heal the, the sick and the brokenhearted, to release the oppressed and set prisoners free. Uh, to Then there's a, a number of passages that say that, that you know, to, to ex, there's an exchange going on, and that those people, the poor, the sick and blind and lame, the prisoners and the oppressed are going to become uh, oaks of righteousness, and then they're going to repair cities. And that's what's happening through this woman. And, and the government is against her. The government will come in and just take buildings that they built and just say, they're not yours anymore, they're ours. And she just goes, okay, well, let's build another building. <laughs> we'll just believe God for the money for another school. And that's how that little rock is 
changing a nation. And that nation one day will be different. It will be completely different because, uh, because someone said, you know, the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom is God's main instrument in the world to bring change. And so I just want to ask you, I, I believe the Lord, you know, wants you to experience that in a fresh way in your life, that uh, if you experience the power of the kingdom, you know, like Kathy was explaining, there was right over near where we're sitting, there was a guy that would come in every day, he and his family, there was a, a little group of Roman Catholic people and a couple of priests that were with them, and this guy walked in, he had these crutches, right, he was, he was older than me, which is, he's an older guy. And he, he would, he's just walking in like this, and it turns out he's got Parkinson's disease. And he can't speak very well at all, because, you know, as Parkinson's advances, you just, it's one of the, the faculties that you lose. And the last night, Randy's praying, he said, there's people that are getting healed right now. If you feel like, we're not even praying for people yet. He said, there's people that are getting healed right now. If that's you, and right over, right over beside us, this guy starts going like this. Now, I've only seen him. I was sitting right beside him every day till the last day. And he's got these little crutches he, you know, walked with. And uh, he's going like this. And I'm, and I'm thinking, hope, hoping somebody's holding that guy up, you know. <laughs> and uh, and, and then, I'm, then a little while later, I'm standing behind, and he's still doing that. And uh, I could see the crutches are leaning against his chair. And then uh, they ask him what happened, and he yells out, uh, you know, or someone yells for him, I got healed of Parkinson's disease. And then he starts running around the auditorium. And then they bring him a microphone, and he's speaking normally. So he's, he's an older guy, so he's, it's not like he's 15. And so he's, you know, he's, uh, he's walking like me. But he's not using his crutches, and he's talking normally. And these people around him who came with him are just weeping because they've seen him, you know. This is what happens when you see someone really get healed of something. You've been close to him. You just, you weep. You just go, oh, my gosh. Yeah, he had it for 12 years. Yeah, he had it for 12 years. And, it, you know, it's a, it's a progressive disease. So, um, we just, you know, we've, we've always said the, the kingdom of God is something that, that's come. It's here. And we want to welcome the kingdom just to touch us and renew us and refresh us and, and equip us for everything he does, for working in the political world, but also seeing the, the real substantive changes in people and in the world that politics can't ever produce. So some of you uh, feel like, I really, I really feel like called to be part of the political process, called to, you know, champion certain causes, even a particular party, if, you know, so to speak, if you feel like something, you know, is important to you. I think the Lord wants to touch you to be leaven in that arena. And others of you, the Lord just wants to touch you, like you did with you did Kathy during the meeting and that man. He just has grace for you and healing for you. And there's others of us, which is all of us. He wants to equip us to be those workers that, are, that go into, you know, where we live and work and play and learn, and we bring the good news there, and we begin to see those changes that, that are in God's heart for those places and those people. So, how do you know, because uh, I... We, like Randy was saying, and I just say it to you again, we don't make things happen. We partner with God. So we look, where's God at work? Where's the Spirit touching someone? And then I can step in there and partner with God, with His authority, and see the kingdom break into that person's life and, and make an impact. So, um, if, if something I've said, something you've heard today, something in the story has, you know, external your heart and you're going, I, I think God's doing something in me. Some of you might feel like a little emotional. They're, not just because you heard an emotional story, but I mean, there's, 
there's a, a, the Spirit will rest on us, and, he, and there's a sense of, of an emotional reaction to the presence of God. Other times, we just feel this weight on us, or peace, or energy, like, you know, like you just feel some, like power on you, or trembling. Uh, or or you're, there's just a hunger inside you, like, I want more. I want more than I have. I just want to ask you to come up, and I just want to pray for a, a, a couple of minutes just to ask for the Spirit to give you what it is that you are hungry for. Could I do that? Just, and, and we're going to dismiss in just a second. Uh, if you need to get your kids, I don't know. I didn't see the kids in today, so I don't know what's going on with the kids. But if you need to you know, get, pick your kids up, please uh, be sure to do that soon. Uh, you'll hear the noise down there if you don't. So anybody that that connects with, that... Uh, just, I want you to make your way up front, not just stand where you are. Just make your way up front, and we'll pray. Close. And then some of, the, some of you who help lead small groups or prayer groups in our church or our prayer team, we just want to come up and, and bless everybody that's up here and just ask for God to give them what they're, what they're hungry for. So if you want prayer... Face, take a couple of steps back. Face the stage. If you're going to help us pray for people, face the people. <laughs> so we can tell them apart. And anytime you need to leave, you're just dismissed to go. But we're going to, we're going to pray for a little while, uh, hang out, and uh, go for it. So, Lord, we thank you for what you're already doing in, in, among us in our hearts. And we just release your presence uh, on these men and women. Let's let your grace begin to fall on them and touch their bodies, touch them in in just a powerful way with the power of your spirit, Lord. And when you start praying for someone, ask them what they want prayer for and, and start there. And if you guys just want to sit and watch, extend your hand towards people and, and just pray uh, for God to bless what, what they're hungry for. So come Holy Spirit. We ask you for more, Lord.